Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first YouTube Live for Schwarzkopf Professional. Uh, my name is Ian Mayer Marzalek, and I'm really happy and excited to be here today for this first YouTube Live. Uh, we're going to be covering all things color theory. So, who am I? I am the senior national trainer for Schwarzkopf Professional here in the US. Uh, I wear lots of hats, but one of my favorites is teaching uh, hair color, color theory, uh, and everything like that. So today we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about color theory. But we're gonna go just a little bit more in depth than maybe what you're used to, uh, and then we'll talk about maybe uh, how you can follow up with us more um, after this uh, short conversation about color theory. So welcome to those of you who are just joining us for our very first YouTube Live. And if you're coming in at a later date to watch this because you just love color theory, welcome to you as well. All right, let's get started. And I want to thank uh, my lovely produ producer. Her name is Jamie. Uh, she is uh, on the back end of this, making sure that this looks really smooth. So thank you. All right, so your, your introduction to color. Think about color and what that means. Uh, I believe a long time ago, I don't know, maybe it was like the 90s or the early 2000s, there was a movie called Pleasantville. And it started all, everything was in black and white. And it really wasn't like you got the point of the movie and what they were trying to say. But um, once things started coming in color, like the lipstick and the roses and the bushes, life became more interesting. So when you think about color as a concept, it really represents communication. Um, it represents, um, so many things like in nature, um, if you uh, like usually the male species of like a bird or something is a lot more brightly colored because they're that's meant to attract a mate. Um, when you think about um, how color can be conventionalism, um, you know, doctors typically wear like blue or green scrubs, um, you know, color represents like uniformity as well like you know we at Schwarzkopf Professional we wear all black because we're a team and that's our team color so color actually can represent quite a bit um, and when it comes to color theory as a whole it it takes part in so many different places whether you're an interior designer trying to figure out which paint colors go best with fabric swatches and whatnot or um, if you are an actual painter or you're a hairdresser, um, there's a lot of different ways that we use color in our life. And color in and of itself can change everything. I'm sure everybody who's watching this live right now has probably walked into a house or an office or a room somewhere and been like, oh God, that's, that's a lot of look um, because they painted everything like yellow or orange or whatever. Um, so it can make you feel things. Color is definitely emotional. Um, and there's also just a whole body of science behind color and how it works and how it interacts. Um, so there's quite a bit to it. And today we're just gonna skim the surface and talk about how does color work and, and really, you know, how, how can we use it to our best advantage? Because I will start this color theory off by saying, and I will say this until the day I quit doing hair, which is probably the day I die. The color wheel is the most important tool out of anything we've got. If you are a hair colorist, the color wheel is the most important tool we've got. So let's dive in. First up, we are going to talk about primary colors. So this is kind of your basic primary color conversation. We um, we learned this in school, like in, in primary school, like first, second grade, um, all about colors. And really primary colors are um, the colors that pretty much make up everything um, when you're talking about this kind of color setup. So in a nutshell, these are colors that can't be made. Um, hold on guys. Uh, these are colors that can't be made. So when you take each, like you can't make blue. However, you can make other colors with what we've got here. So think of these as like the OGs. Um, without them, we wouldn't have any other color um, and you can't make them. So think about what happens when we start mixing them. So it's, we're gonna go to our next slide here. Okay, when you take those three primary colors, you are able to make what we call secondary colors. And there are three of these. So red and yellow, when you mix those together equal parts in a one-to-one -one ratio, you get orange. When you mix red and blue together equal parts one-to-one, -one, you get violet or purple. And then when you mix yellow and blue together equal parts one-to-one, -one, you get green. So that last one, I do wanna point out, um, 
that last one, I do want to point out that, um, you know, in hairdressing, how we sometimes forget that the color wheel means everything to us. Let me ask you a question. Have any of us, I have done it, so I'm, I'm hoping I'm not alone. Um, when we started doing a lot of direct dye application and you had a client that wanted to go blue and you lifted them to where you thought you should have gotten them to like what you thought was pale yellow, but maybe it was just a little bit more yellow than it should be. So then you went ahead and you put your blue direct dye on it. Maybe it was our Igor Colorworks or maybe it was our Chroma ID direct dye, semi-permanent brand or whatever brand that you use. You put the blue on, thought you were going to get like a smashing royal cobalt blue, and instead you got green. I think it's because sometimes we forget in hair color that the color wheel means everything. So it's important to know that when you mix these two, the law of color will always exist. So what would we normally do in that toning situation? You'd probably pre-tone with like a little purple shampoo, or if it's that bad, you'd tone out um, you know, the yellow with violet, as you can see here. Um, to make sure that you have a nice even base. So primary and secondary colors um, are really like kind of the tip of the iceberg. If you're somebody that teaches color theory um, and you want to make it fun, um, you see the picture right here. We can blow up the slide just a little bit. Um, if you teach color theory, this is there's a bunch of different ways that you can um, make it fun if you're in primary school or even like I remember in beauty school, like color theory was kind of boring, but what I did here in this experiment was I got just plain unfrosted cupcakes and we bought the red, yellow, and blue primary color frosting. And so it's a really fun exercise if you do the actual measurements of one-to-one, -one, how you get orange and then yellow, orange, um, and, and the secondary and tertiary colors, which we're gonna talk about in a second. Um, but yeah, these are just really fun ideas that uh, you can use if you happen to teach. All right, moving on. So what happens when we mix primary and secondary colors? We get tertiary colors. So let's take a look a little deeper here at this slide. Tertiary colors are when you take a primary and a secondary in equal amounts and you get a tertiary color. So let's say, for example, this first one right at the top, you've got yellow, which is the primary color. And you've got orange. Remember, orange is a combination of yellow and red. So when you mix yellow and orange, you get a color called yellow-orange. Now, something to remember in tertiary colors, they always start with the primary color in naming them. And what I mean is take a look at, you know, blue and violet. Violet is the secondary color there. So when you mix blue, which is a primary, violet, which is a secondary, in equal parts, you get blue-violet. It wouldn't be violet-blue, it would be blue-violet. So it's something, um, it, this is where we start getting into really being creative, um, you know, figuring out what's gonna work on, on, on who, but really truly understanding your primary, your secondary, and your tertiary colors allows you to really become an artist in what we call chromatic colors. Um, these are colors that are pure in tone. Um, they aren't light or dark. They just are. So we're going to pop into a little bit of a conversation about that because that's where um, color theory gets really fun. So I think it's the next slide. Yes. Okay. No, we're going to talk about that in a minute. So let's stick to the, to the pure tone colors that we're talking about now. So you've got your color wheel, right? All of these make up uh, the color wheel, your primaries, your secondaries, your tertiaries. There's also a different facet to color theory to take into consideration. Complementary colors do a couple of things. Think about that client that we were talking about, um, who you lifted up to that pale yellow, but maybe it was just a little bit more yellow than you thought. Looking at the color wheel here on the screen a little bit more in depth, you can see that if I have yellow in the hair, what lives across from yellow? It's violet. So when you have a client who has yellow underlying pigment that is exposed from lifting and you wanna get rid of it, you have to use something that's violet. That might be a violet shampoo, it might be a violet-based toner, uh, it might be a violet-based conditioner, who knows? But in order to neutralize that yellow, you need something 
in a violet of the same depth. What do I mean there? I mean, if I, if I get somebody up to like a really, 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 really pale yellow, and I use a little bit of a deeper violet, I'm gonna drop the intensity or the brightness of that pale yellow. Now the opposite effect, and this might ring true a little bit more and, and you'll be able to visualize this. If I lift somebody to like a level eight or nine underlying pigment yellow, and I use a pastel violet toner, it's gonna kill a little bit of that yellow, but it's not at the same level. So in order for me to cancel out and neutralize truly, the two tones have to meet at the same level or they won't work. Complementary colors, like we just uh, explained, they, they will neutralize each other when you mix them together. Now, the, the weird thing about complementary colors is that they also boost each other. And what I mean is, um, when you put them next to each other, they make each other stronger because they oppose each other. And I'll explain that a little bit. Um, think about in interior design. If you want the most amount of contrast uh, and you had maybe a purple couch, you would probably buy yellow pillows for that purple couch to make sure that you have a lot of contrast and they boost each other. <laughs> Uh, we also have um, a little funny theory. Um, Chris, I'm from Chicago, but we have a little funny theory called Christmas, Easter, and the Bears. Think about the, the main colors for Christmas. It's red and green. They complement each other, and they complement each other because they oppose each other. So when you mix them together, you muddy out and you get a neutralization of, of themselves. But when you put them next to each other, they show up a lot. Easter, violet and yellow. And not that I would know this in depth, but we have a team here called the Bears. Their big colors are blue and orange. So that was when I went in beauty school here in Chicago. This is how we remembered our complementary colors. So now that we know a little bit more about um, the primary colors, secondary colors, tertiary colors, and those colors are known as chromatic colors. We just mentioned that a little bit ago. Chromatic colors are the colors that are pure in tone. So in the world of hair color, what would that mean? These would be like your pure tones. Um, for example, like a direct eye, it's, it is what it is. It's, it's a purple, it's a blue, it's a red. It doesn't have level. It doesn't have lightness or darkness. So a chromatic color is pure in tone uh, as well in hair color. Think of your, your, your kickers, your concentrates, the, the pure tones that you add to your colors to tweak or, or adjust your formula. So chromatic colors, they are the pure toned, jewel tones. They are what they are. They don't have any level. Now there's another group of color called achromatic color. Let's take a look a little bit deeper in, in what we're talking about here. Achromatic, whoop, I think, yeah. Zoom that in, please, thank you. <laughs> Did we skip ahead? Yay, technology's fun. Okay, I think, uh, go back just one more. Thank you, Jamie. This is our first live. We're doing really good. <laughs> All right. So we talked about chromatic colors. And then you've got a, a, a section of, of colors called achromatic colors. These are black, white, and gray. So remember, when we were talking about chromatic colors, we had the primary, the three primary colors, which were red, yellow, and blue. Well, in achromatic colors, there are only two primary colors, black and white. Now think about that in concept. We just talked about when you mix two opposing colors together, they neutralize themselves out. But when you put them next to each other, they really, uh, they really shine. They really like are, are opposing each other and showing up. Think about in fashion, what are some of the most amazing combinations of colors to use black and white. Um, it's because they have such a stark contrast. So when you mix them together, you only get secondary colors, which would be gray. So white is a primary, black is a primary color, and these are all part of the achromatic family. When you mix black and white, you get a secondary achromatic color, widely known as gray. So these colors, these achromatic colors are literally the opposite 
of chromatic colors. Chromatic colors are pure tone. Achromatic colors have no tone, <laughs> essentially. They are black, white, and everything in the middle, which are gray. So it really does follow the same um, law of color, just without color. <laughs> I mean, they are color, but you know. Okay, let's move on. So let me see here. Okay, yes, perfect. So then we're gonna look a little bit further into this slide right here so we can finish up our achromatic and then we're gonna talk about how they intersect and what that means. So let's blow this up a little bit. Okay, the more white you add to a secondary achromatic color, i.e. gray, the lighter it gets, but it doesn't have tone. It just becomes a lighter gray. Think of this as like a monochromatic palette. There's no fluctuation. There's no hue. There's no, oh, maybe there is hue, but it basically is just black, white, and then all the different 50 shades of gray, ha ha ha, um, in the middle, if you will. The more black you add to the gray, it just becomes a deeper gray. So what are we getting at here? We've talked about chromatic colors. We've, I mean, achromatic colors is really simple. It's black, white, and then gray. Where do the two intersect? Let's see what's next. All right, let's blow this up and take a deep look onto this one because this is where things get interesting. So like we said, um, to give any kind of depth to a combination of primary colors, you simply add black. What is that? What do I mean? Yellow, red, green. When you mix all those together, you get like a gray color. When you mix yellow, red, and blue all together, you get like a grayish brown color. Um, you, when you mix yellow, red, and black, you also get a gray. But now think about this. In theory, the amount of black you add will determine how dark the results are. Totally, totally understand that. But that also changes when it comes into contact with the hair, uh, where sometimes darker shades could look more dark, uh, like a gray brown, rather than like a pure black. And it just depends on what their natural level is. So regardless of how you use black, it will always uh, basically uh, knock back or take away from the brightness of any chromatic color and make them look a little bit flatter or duller. Um, so one thing that I, I liked to um, discuss, I have a program that I teach at our academy in Los Angeles. It's called Master of Color, and we do cover exactly what we're looking at right now. If you had to take just chromatic colors, so our red, yellow, blue, uh, violet, orange, green, you take all of those, but let's start with the primaries, our three primary colors. You've got red, yellow, and blue. What is the lightest of those primary colors? Yellow, and it shines the brightest. What is the deepest of our chromatic or primary colors? It would be blue. So you can kind of use those to also lighten or darken or anchor uh, whatever your color of choice is when you're working only with chromatic colors. But now think about it. Think if you were a chemist in a lab somewhere um, and you had a request to make a level five red. You could take red, but how do you make red darker? If you think about just primary colors, the deepest one is blue. But if I add blue to red, what do I get? Purple, I don't get a darker red. If I added, if I wanted to make the red lighter and I was only living in a world of chromatic colors, the lightest of the three chromatic uh, primary colors is yellow. So could I add yellow to my red to make it lighter? It would make it lighter, but it wouldn't be red anymore. It would be orange. So how do I take this world of chromatic colors and lighten or darken it? You simply combine a combination of achromatic colors, whether it's white, gray, or black. So this is where things start to get interesting. We're gonna pop onto our, our next one. Let's go ahead and take a deeper look on this one because this is where things start to really come together and make sense. So the color grid is essentially a scale of lightness or darkness. It's really great to kind of like try and train your eyes. Um, it helps you to assess, you know, how light or dark something is uh, when it's next to something else. 
uh, what's the difference between like more pure tone shades versus shades that have level or that are muted by either white, gray, or black. Um, chocolate, for example, or a medium brown chocolate is a darkened orange. So orange to mix with some kind of black to give it depth. Think about it. Orange is a secondary color. It's a combination of yellow and red. But how do I make orange darker? I can't add more red because it's just going to go more red. I need something with lightness or darkness in order to make a color have level. So in this case, you would mix in some degree some kind of black to the mix. The final brown, brown shade that you get um, is a combination of your primaries, but depending on what level you're at, uh, also includes uh, some sort of achromatic color. So a fun activity, if you are somebody who teaches color theory, uh, like I do, uh, a really fun activity to get people to understand how this works would be to take, uh, you know, like flip chart paper, like a big piece of paper, group off your people, you know, two, three people, and give each group one chromatic color. This group is teal, this group is purple, this group is red, however you want to do it. So you'll give them that one tube of chromatic color and then give each table a tube of black and a tube of white paint. That could be acrylic paint you get from Michaels. The goal of this exercise is to mark out 10 squares along your flip chart paper and tell people, I want you to make your red lighter and darker utilizing white and black achromatic colors only. And it's a really fun experiment because most of the time, uh, you know, people have different approaches to how they do it. They will, you know, just they'll measure out like, oh, if I add one more drop of white to my mix, then obviously that will equal a level lighter. Uh, I, if I add, you know, specific measurements of black to my mix, it'll make my red darker, you know, as we go. The funny thing that you stumble across uh, when you talk about like darker grays and blacks is that they kind of take over and that perfectly measuring out how much black you add to that red or that teal or that violet all of a sudden they're trying to get a level four and they're already at black. Um, and this also equates to um, hair color formulations as well. Um, you know, you can't mix level one and, and level five and expect to get a level three. It's pretty much going to be darker than a level three closer to black because black takes over. The same is true for white. You really have to be careful because you could really shear out your whole entire formula or, or, or paint color or what have you and lose any depth and now all of a sudden it becomes like this you know bubblicious kind of pink instead of like a really true beautiful pastel so it's a really fun exercise to train people's eye on what to look for when you're adding depth or when you're adding lightness to a color so this is a really cool uh, chart and it's a fun activity if you're somebody who teaches color theory as well all right we're moving along Okay, this is, we got really get, we got to look at this one straight on because this is where this all comes together. This is the come into the sphere. If you think about how color works, we've talked about primary colors, secondary colors, tertiary colors. We also discussed that all of those colors are chromatic colors. They have tone. Then we discussed achromatic colors. Primary achromatic colors are black and white. Secondary achromatic colors are every shade of gray in between. Then we got into how do I make red lighter if I'm only using chromatic colors? You kind of can't. I mean, you can, but then it doesn't hold on to that initial shade anymore. I can't make red lighter with yellow because it becomes orange. I can't make red darker with blue because it goes purple. So the color wheel really is just like this vicious uh, circle or this uh, cycle. It all comes back to itself. So think of the color wheel as something that is two dimensional. It's something we use and that we need every day behind the chair if you are doing hair color. But if you really want to think about how these two worlds of chromatic and achromatic colors intersect, it's really right here, the color sphere. It covers absolutely the full spectrum of shades, and it gives you a chance to see how colors are both divided in uh, warm and cool uh, shades, 
but also what does that mean when I'm adding a chromatic color to my chromatic color? So cooler colors, green, blue, violet, they're on the left side of the wheel. Your warmer uh, primary, or I'm sorry, uh, chromatic colors are yellow, orange, and red. Those you can see on the right. Now, in line with our with the color system and terminology um, that's that we use all the time in hairdressing, um, in some cases we would maybe use names for our colors. Um, that's a really fun way to create a color for a client and then call it like butterscotch or you know red wine or you know, whatever. <laughs> Be creative. Uh, you know, when you talk about yellow, you know, you don't ask a blonde, oh, would you like a bright yellow result? You say, would you like a nice warm golden color or what have you? Um, you know, and, and our, our kind of dash two ash shades are, are has like a gray tone to it. And so we don't call it, you know, oh, let's gray her out. Well, I mean, not now we do because it's gray is in, but in the world of hair color, we would refer to that as ash. But the color sphere right there is really where it's at because it, it, brings together this two-dimensional color wheel and then adds the whole like three-dimensionality of achromatic colors and how you truly get lighter or darker um, you know when you're trying to formulate or, or mix paint or what have you. So I don't think let me pop over to see if we have any comments or questions. Oh Madison, that's awesome. This is so helpful. Thank you for sharing this. Brilliant. Um, that is awesome. Uh, and then can you explain why do natural shades dash zero turns a little bit greenish? Absolutely. Uh, da a dash zero shade, if you, for example, used a dash zero by itself, um, dash zero, I mean, on a, on a very basic level, dash zero, you would think is a pr combination of the primaries, red, yellow, and blue. So if the natural shade that you're using and it depends on the brand but i'll just give you like the base information if the natural shade that you're using um has a bit more um blue or or, or yellow in the case a lot of naturals are formulated so that the the red or the orange that gets exposed as underlying pigment as you lift is then counteracted with to be a natural um so if the hair doesn't have a lot of underlying warmth and the neutral that you're using is a little bit of yellow blue heavy out of red yellow and blue yellow and blue make green and if somebody doesn't have enough natural red or warmth to meet that green in the middle your end result would be a little bit greenish which is super annoying but i do understand because it's happened to us all um, so yeah, that was great. Um, I don't see that we have any more questions, but I think we're just about at our time. So um, this was great. Uh, thank you for for tuning in. Uh, oh no, I'm exposed. My my cover is exposed. <laughs> we tried to make a nice backdrop. No, you're fine. Um, so join us anytime. We have a lot of um, education that we host, um, and all you have to do is go to our website, which is www.schwarzkopf-professionalusa. Dot com, you would go under the education tab, and then there's another little sub tab called purchase tickets. Uh, we've got live virtual education happening every single month. Um, and as well, come back to our YouTube page because we have brand specific intro seminars on every brand that we've got Agora Royal, Blonde Me, uh, Agora Color 10. Um, and now this one will live as one of our Color Theory 101s. If you really want to get into color theory, hair color, how it works, and the science behind it and everything, there is a seminar that I teach live when we are doing live classes again called Master of Color. And this is where we spend 10 days essentially breaking this down and applying it to what you do every single day behind the chair. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, and for those of you who uh, are coming back to watch it, thanks for watching. Hope this helps. Um, and we're excited to kick off our, this is our first live for YouTube. So thank you to our Digi team for uh, inviting me to do this and uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thanks.